We're going to continue to look today at, into the uh, book of Ephesians. We are up to chapter 2 today where we're going to look at the first three verses. I would like to read those for you from God's Word, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Lord, we pray that you would open up this, your word, to our hearts, that we would see it clearly and be encouraged in all that you've done for us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We sometimes talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ um, as being good news. And the reason we say it's good news, because that's what the word gospel means. It simply is a Greek word that means good news. And uh, good news is good uh, depending on how bad the bad news is. In other words, good news in and of itself isn't all that significant. It has to be linked to something else. It has to be linked to bad news. For example, um, if I said today, we've discovered, scientists have discovered a cure for cancer, you would say to yourself, well, that's really good news. And why would you say that? You would say it because we all know people who have had cancer or who have died from cancer or who will probably get cancer. We have enough experience to know that cancer is, permeates everything and every, every family and every community. So therefore, a cure for cancer is really good news. Now, if I were to if we were to live in a world where one person a year died from cancer out throughout the entire world, and I stood up and I said, we have discovered a cure for cancer, you would say, well, okay, so what? It's only one person. The good news isn't all that good. Now, if I were to say, you have cancer, and we have discovered a cure for cancer, now all of a sudden the good news is really, really, really good news. But you see, the good news is only good news based on how bad the bad news was that preceded it. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, is, are, that's the bad news of the gospel. It shows us how desperate the situation is. And so when the good news comes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6 and 7 and 8, and nine, then all of a sudden it breaks in as really good news. Now, before we look at, and we're going to look at the bad news this morning, so I got to tell you this is, in, in one hand, this is depressing. On the other hand, it is glorious because it reminds us where we've come from. The, the, there are a couple of things we need to look at before we look into detail in the bad news. And the first of all, we need to consider this, is that the bad news is universal bad news. In other words, it doesn't just apply to one particular group or one particular uh, section of society. Or, or, or It's everybody. If, if you look at verse 1, it says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But then by the time you, you get to verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, and whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. So he's including himself now by the time we get to verse 3. And by the time you get to the end of verse 3, it says, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So he goes from saying you to we to everybody, all mankind, throughout all ages, throughout all history. It, uh, actually, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 are a lot like Romans, the first three chapters in Romans. If you're familiar with that, Romans chapter 1 reminds us how sinful this pagan world is. You know, they've turned their back on God. They're blind to God. They don't see God. But then in Romans chapter 2, Paul reminds us how sinful the Jewish people are. And he says, do you Jews, you people who judge these pagans, do you do the same thing? So he reminds them how sinful they are. And then by the time you get to Romans chapter 3, he says, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one good, no one righteous, no, not one. The bad news is universal bad news. It affects all of us. And the second thing to understand is that the bad news here is, um, is past tense when we read this. You were dead 
in, in which you once walked, following the power uh, amongst whom we once lived in verse 3, and we were by nature children of wrath. He's talking about the past tense. Boyce, uh, James Montgomery Boyce, when he preached on this text, he, he titled the sermon, as I stole his title, he says, The Way We Were. And that's important. We typically look in the past and we're nostalgic about the past. You know, we look at all the good things in the past. But sometimes we look at the past and we say, wow, I, the past was really chaotic and indecisive and, uh, and a mess. And look how, look how God brought me out of that mess and brought me where I am today. And that's what the Apostle Paul's doing. He's looking back and he's seeing the mess, but he's looking back so that he can look forward and rejoice in God's goodness. And it's the bad news that gets us uh, to the good news. Actually, um, th when, when the Apostle Paul obviously wrote this letter, he didn't put the chapter titles or the chapter numbers in. You know that, don't you? There weren't verses. There were, in, in other words, ideas would flow from one, one thing to the other. And many commentators point out that it's, it's sort of a... Um, unfortunate chapter division here between chapters one and chapter two. In other words, the flow is to continue in chapters two, verse one. You notice by the conjunction, and you were, he's, con he's connecting it to what he just said earlier. And what he's been talking about earlier, he's been talking about the power of God. And he's been talking about the power of God to raise the dead, the power of God that brought Jesus back from the dead, right? And gave Jesus life. Um, and the power of God who seated Jesus into a heavenly place, and the power of God who put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him as head of the church. So he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus in chapter 1, but now he's going to talk about our resurrection in chapter 2 in verse 1. Jesus was dead but made alive by God. Now in chapter 2, you were dead but have been made alive by God. So it, it is a continuing theme about the power of God. And in order to see the power of God in our lives, we have to see where we came from, the way things were. All right, so how bad was this past that we once lived in? Well, he, he's going to mention three things. And first, he's going, to, he's going to say, first of all, he's going to say that we were dead in our trespasses and sins from verse 1. Now, the thing about being dead is that you're not halfway dead. You're either... <laughs> You, you know, it's a definitive thing. When you're dead, you're dead. You're, it's not, it, there's not an in-between place there. There's not almost dead. There's not, you know, on life support death. Uh, there, there's not mostly dead. What's that old, there's a Monty Python running gag, you know, in the movie where they talk about, oh, well, he's mostly dead. Well, he, you know, there is no such thing. A lot of times when we share the gospel or we talk about the gospel, we sometimes use the illustration that the, the gospel is like a person who's about to drown in the ocean, you know, and they're, they're out in the water and they're, they're grasping for air and they're, they're, they're flinging their limbs as hard as they can and they're about to drown and somebody throws them a life preserver and the life preserver is Jesus and you just grab a hold of the life preserver and, and God pulls you into the boat and rescues you. Now, that, that's a good illustration of how God is the one who saves us, but the reality is, and it isn't a good illustration of how God saves us, because if you wanted to use that illustration biblically, what he's talking about here in verse 1 is we're not on top of the water, gas, you know, paddling as fast as we can, looking for a life preserver. It's more like we're at the bottom of the ocean and we've become fish food, and Jesus dives in and breathes life to us at the bottom of the ocean. So now we have, because we're dead, you see, and once Jesus breathes life into us, then we have the power to swim to the top of the ocean and grab the life preserver. You were dead in your transgressions, in your trespasses, rather, and sins. Now, the trespasses and sins describes what kind of death it is, and immediately you know that he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about a spiritual death. He's talking about a death to God. A, 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 he's talking about a spiritual situation in which we think we know who God is, but we really don't. Or a situation is where, where we think we are on the right path, but we're really blind to what the right path is. 
And he's talking about a situation where we are blinded to God and his truth. We're blinded to the Savior. We're blinded to his Son. We're blinded to the Scriptures. We're blinded to everything. We are dead to God. We don't know who he is. We don't know how to obey him. We don't know how to live for him. We don't know where salvation comes from. And as a result, we don't know how sinful we really are. We are dead in trespasses and sins. If you think about it, those two words actually... Uh, go together. Trespass is something that you uh, violate, right? There is a, there's a sign that says no trespassing, and you willfully go past the no trespassing sign. You have violated some written law or written code. That's one aspect of what sin is. God has given us laws. He's given us decrees. He's given us the way we should live, and then we violate those laws and decrees you know, you should not lie, you should not commit murder, you should not commit adultery, and all these. And we, we violate those laws, and all of a sudden, we become trespassers. We assume the right that is God to ourselves. You know, God has the right to invent the rules. God has the right to set the standards of what is moral, what is immoral. And when we assume those standards for ourselves, we, we, be, we trespass on God's territory, as it were. But there's another type of sin, and that's what, in the Greek anyway, that's what the next word is. The next word says trespasses and sins. Sin, in, in both the Hebrew form and in the Greek form, the word is often translated that, simply is a word that simply means to miss the mark. So you have a target, you shoot an arrow, and you shoot an arrow, and you don't even hit the target. You know, the arrow goes way over there, or it goes over there, or under, or whatever. You miss, you miss the thing that you're aiming for, and that is sin, too. The Westminster Confession said in the Shorter Catechism that sin is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. Transgression of the law would be a trespass, but want of conformity of, unto is like the old English way of saying, you just didn't measure up to the standard. God told you to be loving and you weren't loving. God told you to worship him. God told you to love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. That's the standard and you didn't live up to the standard. You, you missed the mark. You, instead of shooting, you, you weren't even shooting to the right mark. You, you couldn't measure up. And sin is both of those things. Sin is trespassing and sin is also missing the mark. And because we've missed the mark and because we've trespassed, we are, as it is, alienated from God. Sin brings death. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul that sins will surely die. Isaiah 59.2, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's what it means to be spiritually dead. God doesn't hear as it were. Now, God hears everything. You know what it's saying. But it's saying that God does not hear your voice because he has to respond to sin. He's a holy God, and he has to respond to sin in a certain way. He can't take it on himself. He can't, he, 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 he can't exist in the presence of sin without annihilating sin, without annihilating the sinful thing. And as a result, you're spiritually dead. You're dead to God. Now the second thing he starts then to talk about is how we were enslaved to certain things. Now he begins this in verse uh, 2. Your sins in which you wish to walk following the course of this world, that's one, one description, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, that's a second thing. And thirdly, he talks about in whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh. So if you notice there real carefully, he's talked about those three things, and we've talked about these before. He's talking about the world, the flesh, and the devil. These are the, these are the three battles that we, we face in this life, and they are the three battles that we constantly, constantly lose when we're dead to God. We are too influenced by the world. We are too influenced, we are too succumbed to the flesh, to our desires. 
and where you're too influenced by the prince of the power of the, of the air, the spirit at now at work in the sons of disobedience. Some people think that's a reference to, to the devil himself, or, or other people think it's more of a general reference to the spirit that Satan and the demonic forces of this world sort of, they permeate everything. You know, in the, uh, in the Old Testament, well, and even in the New Testament, uh, the language is fairly clear that when you worshiped false gods, you were actually worshiping demons. And that spirit of false worship, that spirit of wanting to worship something other than God is a part of the spirit of the air, the demonic forces that are at work in our world. The world refers to um, our, our culture or the, or the, uh, the worldview, the, the mindset of the world, the values of this world. In Romans chapter 12, verse two, we're told not to be conformed to this world, but but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In other words, there's a danger in living in this world, and the danger is that the world is going to want, to want you to do what it does. It's going to want you to think like it thinks. It's going to want you to behave like it behaves. And all you need to do to, to, to prove this out is look at something as simple as fashion, right? Fashions come and go, right? If I showed up this morning in a leisure suit, I actually used to have one of these, a leisure suit and a wide tie, you would, you would all laugh at me. Why? Because I don't conform to the fashion of the particular day and the particular age. And you say, oh, well, that's embarrassing. And then you would try to embarrass me. And I would be embarrassed. Why? Because I want to be accepted. I want to be conformed. I want to look like all of you. I want to dress like all of you look. I, you know what I'm saying? I want to, I want to be a part of this world. That's the, that's the human nature. And it's not true in something as simple as fashion. I mean, who cares about fashion? But it's true about things in terms of the worldview, what the world thinks about God, what the world thinks about morality. The world calls us and says, look, think like we think. Do what we do. Rationalize things the way we rationalize. And if you don't, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna laugh at you. We're going to put you on the periphery of society. We're going we're gonna to not entertain you into uh, you know, our social media forums because you don't have anything worthwhile to contribute. We're going to ostracize you if you don't think like we do. And that's the struggle that we have. And you know what? When you are dead in your trespasses and sins, you give in to that every time. You think like the world, you dress like the world, you have the values of the world. I had a friend that, I have a friend that I meet with um, on a regular basis and we were talking um, last week and, and uh, about a particular moral issue that he had been struggling with and um, he was talking to a friend about this particular thing and his friend was accusing him of not thinking modernly. You're not, you're not thinking you know, like the modern person thinks. You're not thinking in a contemporary way. You're thinking in too old fashioned a way. And his res I was really proud of him. His response was, I don't care the way the world thinks. I care what the Bible says. I care what God says. Because that's how I'm gonna think. That's how I'm gonna rationalize things. And that is the Christian mindset, but it's not the world's mindset. The world, the devil, we talked about the, the, the influences of the spirit of this age and the flesh. Now the flesh simply relates to our desires and our passions that we all too often cannot control. Uh, you know, desires aren't bad in and of themselves. Eating is not a, a, a bad desire. It's actually very, very good. If you have no desire to eat, you, you're in big trouble. But if you eat too much, you become a glutton. Your passion becomes out of control. And that's true with all the other things. I mean, sleeping is a good thing. You need rest. You better get your rest. But if you rest too much, you become slothful and lazy and you don't want to do anything, right? All the other passions, they're good things that God has created, but if they're not restrained, if they're not put in their proper place and in their proper context, all of a the sudden they begin to drive us to extremes. And the nature of the flesh is to do just that, to drive us to these extreme uh, positions. There are carnal desires such as laziness, gluttony, greed, lust. There are mental sins, which, you know, pride, malice, envy, anger, all of these things that come to us 
are, are things that we battle every day. And when we are living dead in our trespasses and sins, we give in to those things. We are victim of those things. We are enslaved by those things. We can't get out of those things. And as a result, our alienation from God continues because we do carry out the desires of our flesh. We do disobey God. And we are, and this is the third thing, we are by nature children of wrath. Now, it was pretty bad to be dead in your trespasses and sins. That's a, not a good thing. It gets a little worse when you realize that you're, you're dead, but you're alive to sin. In other words, you're dead to God, but you're, you're enslaved to these habits and these sins you can't get away from. That's the, the second thing. That's even worse. But it gets worse than all of that because Paul says that we are under wrath. Now, whose wrath are we under? Well, the short of it is we're under the wrath of God. Now, the wrath of God is not a popular topic nowadays. Not even popular in the church. You Very seldom will you hear a sermon about the wrath of God. Seldom will you hear one mentioned. But you can't read the Bible without escaping it. I read one commentator said that there were over 600 references to the wrath of God in the scriptures between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, they didn't always use the word wrath, but sometimes it used other words, but it was still the idea of wrath or the idea of judgment or the idea of God's anger. Um, let's look at a couple of them. Um, Exodus 32.10, now therefore let me alone. This is God speaking, by the way. God needs to watch his language. You know what? He just offends too many people. Listen to this. Exodus 32.10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that, that I may make a great nation out of you. This is what he says to Moses about his people. Psalm 95.11. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, this is God speaking, they shall not enter my rest. Isaiah 60.10, foreigners shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you for in my wrath I struck you. Hebrews 12.29, for our God is a consuming fire. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth of righteousness. Now, interestingly enough, what that says is the wrath of God is present in our world today in, in certain contexts in the hearts of people. First Thessalonians 1.10 will say that the wrath of God is also a future reality and, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So there's a present wrath, but there's also a wrath to come. Now, when the Bible talks about the wrath of God or the anger of God, it's always rooted, and this is important for us to understand, it is always rooted in justice. What is just? What is right? And it is, while, it's some, while it might have emotion to it, it is not rooted in emotionalism. You know, the, the problem with our anger and our wrath is that our anger and wrath is rooted in emotionalism. Somebody steps on my toe and boy, it hurts. And boy, now I'm, I'm angry. What, it, it is my emotions and feelings that drive me. But God's wrath does, isn't driven by emotions or feelings. His wrath is driven by justice, by righteousness, by his holiness. Jesus, by the way, got angry, right? He got angry in a righteous way. He was angry at the Pharisees. He calls them whitewashed tombs. Why? Because they were preventing uh, other people from seeing the truth of who God was. They, they had put a system in place that made it so difficult to know God that very few people knew God in the way that they should. And, he, and Jesus blames the Pharisees, and he's angry at them. Jesus was angry at the money changers in the temple. They were making the place that the Gentiles would have come and prayed to God. They were making that place into a marketplace, and he was angry. Uh, he was angry at Herod. He calls him a fox. He's angry, uh, he's angry in a number of different contexts, but his anger is always rooted in justice and in righteousness. He is angry because things that people are doing are hurting other people. You know, a lot of people say, well, God is a God of love. He can't be a God of wrath. And I suggest to you something. 
that in order for God to be a God of love, he must be a God of wrath. He can't be one without the other. Think about this. If you really love someone or something, if that thing or that person that you love is abused or desecrated or harmed, and you are not justly angry or upset, then the question is, did you really love that person? Think, think about this. Suppose you have a, if you have a child, for example, that comes under some sort of tragic, violent death, a horrific thing happens, and you say, well, you know, I'm a loving person, and, and it's uh, tragic, but um, it's just the way it is. People would say, are you really loving? Do you realize what just happened to your child? If something tragic happened to someone that you loved, you would by nature be angry. And if you weren't, people would question your love. So when God puts people on this earth in his own image and those people are abused and those people are taken advantage of and his image is maligned, God by nature, if he loves those things, if he loves his image, if he loves his holiness, if he loves his people, he must by nature be angry and he must by nature demand justice or he isn't very loving. And you and I were under God's wrath, his just, his measured, his perfect, his holy wrath until something happened. Now I know this is depressing, you're saying this is Mother's Day, you should be talking about mothers. I, um, but you know, hey, I was thinking about this, you know, um, most of you probably had mothers that at one time or another got angry with you. And because they are Imperfect. Sometimes their anger was imperfect and it wasn't justified. But my guess is there were lots of times where your mother's anger and wrath was quite justified. And it was quite used by God to shape you into a better person. And yet you still love your mother. You don't say your mother was an unloving person. At least most of us don't. Because most of us had loving mothers who had measured anger. Who had measured justice in our homes. And that's God. And we were under his wrath. So you see, the, the reason that the gospel is not good news, you go to people and you say, I have good news. Jesus died so that we wouldn't have to be under God's wrath. And they say, ho-hum. And why do they say ho-hum? Because they don't understand the wrath of God. They don't understand the holiness of God. They don't understand the doctrine of who God is. And as a result, it's not very good news. But the Apostle Paul understood it, and you and I understand it. And the point is that we were dead. We were enslaved by the things of this world, and we were under wrath. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive. Isn't the gospel good news? It's only good news because the bad news is really, really bad. But God in his mercy saves us. He even say, this is the extraordinary thing. God by his mercy saves us from his wrath by himself absorbing his wrath on the cross in the form of his son. How does God save us from wrath? He saves us from wrath by be taking on his wrath. He takes on the punishment that we deserve. And he gives us the power to overcome things like the world and the flesh and the devil. And he dives into the bottom of the ocean and he breathes life into us so that our eyes are opened and our hearts are enlightened to these things. That's how good God is. That's how merciful God is. That's how powerful our God is. Do you know that power? Do you know that new life? Do you know that regeneration that has made you into a living, breathing, new person? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your gift of grace and mercy. We are thankful that we can stand here today. We can sit here in this room today and we can say we were dead. We were enslaved by the world and we were under wrath, but thanks be to God because of his great mercy.
Lord, make us alive today. Make us aware of the good news of the gospel. And help us to rejoice in it. Help us to celebrate it. Help us to proclaim it with great joy and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.